My name is Ali Fine. Uh, I'm the local chapter chair for Physicians for a National Health Program, the New York Metro chapter. Uh, and it's really good to see such a wonderful crowd here tonight. <laughs> Let me take this opportunity to say that uh, putting this night together was really uh, a task that our new executive director took on, and I think all of us should give her a great applause. <laughs> Lori, will you raise your hand? Lori Wen, raise your hand so people see who you are. There, great. And also standing in the back, you know, the fortune of our being able to use this facility for this activity has everything to do with Dr. Len Rodberg. So, <laughs> so tonight we're going to hear from Wendell Potter. Mr. Potter was uh, actually born and grew up in Northeast Tennessee uh, in the mountains of Appalachia. Uh, he then went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee, where he majored in communications uh, and earned his bachelor's. From there, he went on to become a journalist, uh, an activity that he undertook for about five to six years, uh, working for newspapers in Memphis, in Knoxville and in Washington, D.C. He then decided that he would go into public relations and started to do that with a nonprofit uh, health system in Knoxville, uh, the Baptist Health System, and from there was recruited uh, to be uh, one of the PR people for Humana in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, in 1989. He was there for about four years uh, and from that position was attracted to uh, Cigna uh, where he was vice president of corporate communications. Cigna is, as I understand it, the fourth largest health insurance company in the United States today. Um, in that position, he really learned what a health insurance company does. And we're going to hear, I'm sure, a lot about that. But apparently, one of the things that really irked at his conscience uh, was in 2007 uh, witnessing remote area medical in Virginia uh, this is a group of doctors that provides free health care. Uh, they do it essentially for a period of a weekend or a week. Um, and there were just these enormous lines of people waiting to see these doctors uh, in, you know, essentially made up uh, examining rooms. And the problem was they had no health insurance. Uh, so in 2008, he resigned from Cigna um, and then began to explore how was it that he could, in fact, express his conscience. Uh, and uh, in, he has now joined the Center for Media and Democracy, uh, is also an analyst for the Center for Public Integrity, uh, and in October of 2009, produced this book that you all have seen, Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider speaks on how corporate PR is killing health care and deceiving Americans. So put your hands together and let's welcome <laughs> Wendell Potter. Thank you, Wendell. Thanks very much. Boy, am I uh, impressed with this crowd and very honored to be among you all. Let's see. Should I talk closer? Oh, you don't have to get closer. Just a little higher. All right. That's fine. Very good. Thanks. Um, I've often said um, 
that um, I, I truly am honored to be among people who've spent a lot more time advocating for real reform than I have. So I'm, I'm humbled to be among your midst and, 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 and uh, truly honored to be invited to speak to you tonight. I'm going to start by reading something from the book. I don't often do this, but um, I wanted to read something that you may scratch your head and wonder, why am I reading this? And, and it's not specifically or directly pertaining to health care. Um, but I think I'll explain the relevance in just a few minutes. It's, it's in the section called The Playbook, and this is the, uh, subheaded, uh, the part subheaded Big Soda. With evidence mounting that sugary sodas and other beverages are a leading contributor to the obesity epidemic in the United States, Congress, some states, and several American cities have considered imposing a special tax on the drinks to reduce consumption and also generate needed revenue to help pay for municipal services. In early 2010, Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter proposed a two cent per ounce tax on all sweetened drinks, and in Washington, D.C., City Council Member Mary Che proposed a one cent per ounce tax on bottled and canned soda that contained sugar. Alarmed, the beverage industry sprang into action to defeat efforts to impose a special tax of any amount on its products. Among the first things the industry did was hire a big PR firm to set up a front group. Americans Against Food Taxes. <laughs> Funded primarily by beverage and food companies and their lobbying groups, AAFT was formed initially to fight a proposed 3 to 10 cent tax on sodas and other sugary drinks that health care reform advocates in Congress had once proposed to help pay for the expansion of insurance coverage in the new health care bill. To obscure its real source of funding, AAFT describes itself as a, quote, coalition of concerned citizens, responsible individuals, financially strapped families, <laughs> small and large businesses and communities across the country, opposed to any government proposed tax on sugar sweetened drinks. But as disclosed on the Center for Media and Democracy's SourceWatch website, the group's membership really consists mainly of lobbying groups for packaged food and soda companies, chain restaurant corporations, and large food and soft drink manufacturers and distributors, including the Coca-Cola Company, Dr. Pepper, Royal Crown Bottling Company, PepsiCo, Canada Dry Bottling Company of New York, the Cannes Manufacturers Institute, 7-Eleven Convenience Stores, and Yum! Brands. The Center for Media and Democracy's investigation found that the group's website, www.nofoodtaxes.com, is registered to Goddard Clausen, the PR and advertising firm that conjured up the Harry and Louise commercials to help defeat the Clinton health care reform plan in the 1990s. Using the, quote, we're part of the solution tactic, which I describe in the book, AAFT launched a campaign to persuade Americans that beverage companies are doing their part to get kids to cut down on their consumption of high-calorie sodas. <laughs> The group has used ads and email blasts to, bla uh, to boast that soda companies have replaced full-calorie soft drinks with, quote, smaller portion and, quote, portion-controlled beverages, real juice and bottled water. Voila, their products are suddenly no longer the problem. They're part of the solution. Even better, now they all get kids to buy more bottled water, which, which costs the companies next to nothing to make, at a dollar a bottle more than they would have paid for a soda. Another part of AAFT's campaign is to generate outrage against the soda tax by calling it a tax on groceries. It is not a tax on groceries. It's just a tax on one class of foods, sugary drinks. But by shifting the focus, the group stands a better chance of getting people, especially low-income people, to oppose the tax. To kill Michael Nutter's proposal in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Beverage Association created a coalition with local businesses, including owners of bodegas throughout the city, and even a labor union, the Teamsters, because its members delivered sodas to stores, restaurants, and schools. The coalition conducted a fear-mongering campaign, arguing that the tax would ruin small business owners and lead to layoffs in the beverage and transportation industries. In other words, it would be a job-killing tax. In the weeks leading up to the Pennsylvania City Council's vote on the proposed beverage tax, the, the beverage industry mounted a full court press, including sending the spokesman for the American Beverage Association to Philadelphia to plot strategy, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer. Lobbyists, according to the Inquirer, are buttonholing city council members, 
Trade groups and unions have locked arms. Industry ads are sprouting in the, on the air and in print extolling the good corporate citizenship of soft drink companies. The public is weighed in with hundreds of calls and emails. The strategy worked in May 2010, despite being millions of dollars short in paying for city services, council members voted down the tax but approved a budget with a projected $130 million shortfall. To help close the budget gap, the council voted to raise property taxes by about 10 percent. But Nutter said even that wasn't enough, to, enough revenue to avoid cutbacks. He also said after the defeat of the proposal that the city would have to cut police, fire, and library services and eliminate 339 jobs. Nutter blamed the beverage industry's intense PR and lobbying campaign for the demise of the proposed tax and, and the need to lay off city workers. Quote, they will literally attempt to do or say anything to prevent what is essentially a good idea, he told the Philadelphia Daily News. The beverage industry's win in Philadelphia was just the latest in a string of victories. The proposed tax in Washington succumbed, to the, succumbed the same week. Uh, Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake saw her proposed tax stall in city council. The only place, in fact, that the industry did not prevail was in Washington State, which approved an excise tax on soda. But as of the writing of this book, lobbyists were trying to persuade legislators there to repeal it. In Washington, D.C., Councilwoman Chase summed up the situation well in a Washington Post story before the vote. Quote, it's hard to fight a multi-million dollar PR effort from Big Soda. Indeed, the same article quoted Ellen Valentino, Executive Vice President of the Maryland, Delaware, D.C. Beverage Association, as saying that her group was prepared to spend, quote, whatever it takes to defeat the tax. And they do. And I read that because that's, that's, that's what they do. Uh, they do whatever it takes to win, whether it's ethical or not. And, uh, uh, and I read that in particular because of the, the passage there about uh, the threat that if that were passed, that jobs would be lost. Uh, that's a common tactic. That's straight from the playbook that I write about in the book. You may have noticed or, or heard that the, uh, the Republicans' bill to repeal the health care reform bill that was proposed, uh, it was going to be avoided on next week, but apparently they're, they're postponing it, or this week, uh, was uh, called, and this is true, a bill to repeal the job-killing health care reform bill. Uh, some PR guy like me wrote that, there's no doubt. That was a two-page bill, uh, and undoubtedly it was not written by a lawmaker but by a PR guy, and using the terms straight from the playbook to try to get people afraid, of, more afraid of this legislation. Uh, and it was just a continuation of the fear-mongering campaign that the industry mounted um, back when I was still working for the industry. I left, as, as Ollie said, in, in 2008, um, but I was, in 2007, uh, part of the effort to try to uh, develop the strategy to blunt the, the passage of a real health care reform bill. My first task, though, uh, in, in 2007, uh, was to uh, help uh, discredit Michael Moore in the movie Sicko, uh, which I describe in the book called The, the, uh, the Campaign Against Sicko. Uh, that movie came at a time when uh, the industry's pollsters were telling us that for the first time ever, and these pollsters have been doing polls for the industry for many, many years, from before the Clinton years, for the first time, uh, more than half of the Americans being polled said that they felt that the, that the government needed to play a significantly greater role in our healthcare system than ever before. Well, this alarmed the healthcare industry, as you can imagine. Uh, and this was coming from a pollster who uh, uh, wouldn't pull any punches. He uh, is Bill McInturf, who uh, has been a longtime Republican pollster as well. And uh, uh, his company, Public Opinion Strategies, has done work for the insurance industry and did the polling for the uh, McCain Palin campaign as well. Uh, and of course, he, the work that he does for the industry is shared with others as well. But that was of great concern to the industry, and it was concern of concern especially because Michael Moore's movie was coming out that very same summer. This was in uh, May that we heard these polling numbers, and 
Michael Moore's movie was, was being uh, filmed initially at the Cannes Film Festival in France uh, in late May, and the first screening in the U.S. was going to be in uh, June in Sacramento. Uh, so the industry uh, sent a spy from uh, uh, Washington, who was on the staff of America's Health Insurance Plans, to the film festival to take notes and, and, and call back after the film was over to tell us all, who, all of us who were waiting on a conference call line uh, what was in the movie. Uh, and, uh, and, and when we heard what was in the movie, we knew our work was cut out for us. Not only did we have to uh, discredit Michael Moore, but we had to disabuse people in the U.S. that the, that the, 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 the film was factual. And if you've seen the movie, you know that uh, he uh, talks about, or he, he uh, portrays people who have insurance, but who have, for one reason or another, been denied care that they need. And folks, that's a, a, an ever-growing problem in this country. Uh, we heard recently that the, the latest statistics uh, show that we now have more than 50 million, almost 51 million people who, who don't have insurance, more than the whole entire population of Spain. Uh, but we uh, have a growing problem with people who are underinsured. And that was one of the reasons I left my job, because I, could, I was becoming increasingly uncomfortable uh, being a spokesman for an industry that was trying to move more and more of us into inadequate health care plans. Uh, they call them consumer-driven plans. That's the euphemism that they came up with to describe these plans that all feature high deductibles. Um, and a lot of people forego the care they need because they can't afford to pay the out-of-pocket expenses they're required to pay by their health insurance companies. 25 million Americans, uh, according to the Commonwealth Fund, uh, were underinsured in 2008. They'll be doing another study this year, and they have every reason to believe that that number will be much higher. So not only do we have 50 million people who don't have insurance, we have at least 25 million, and probably many more than that, who are underinsured. And you're underinsured if, if you have to pay uh, more than 10% of your income, according to the, um, uh, the, the analysis that the Commonwealth Fund did on health care out of your own pocket, if you're, even if you're insured. Um, the problem with the, uh, that we had with, with SICO, of course, was that uh, uh, it was true. And uh, the industry had to mount a campaign to discredit, to discredit Michael Moore as a filmmaker and, as I said earlier, to, to make people continue to think that the care uh, that was provided in Canada, in the UK, in France, in Germany, in Switzerland, and even Cuba, uh, that he, he obviously wasn't telling the truth. How could he be telling the truth when we, of course, have the, the best health care system in the world here in the United States? And as I pointed out in the book, if you believe that, as many Americans do, then that I, when I was a PR guy, earned my, my keep because we wanted people to, to always think that we've got the best health care system in the world. And if we were to look to an example abroad and were to adopt a single-payer system like in Canada, or some other system that we would be losing the, the best healthcare system in the world. Even Speaker Boehner uh, said the other day as he was talking about the need to repeal this legislation that why would we want to mess with a, and, and wreck the best healthcare system in the world. So there's, they, they use these terms uh, especially uh, to make sh sure that they are convincing us to think a certain way. Uh, that is at the core of, of all of the, the industry's efforts here. It's a f there are fear-mongering campaigns that uh, uh, seek to manipulate public opinion, to make us think certain ways. Uh, and the effort against uh, SICO was, uh, was a campaign largely uh, to persuade people from thinking that anybody, any other country could do a health care system better than we. And one of the front groups that was set up with insurance company money and um, drug company money. I see Jack O'Dwyer back there, so I better in, in make, make note that the insurance industry had uh, some support from the pharmaceutical industry. Jack O'Dwyer is with uh, uh, a public relations uh, newsletter called O'Dwyer, O'Dwyer's Newsletter. And, and Jack uh, uh, got a call once after writing about my book from uh, the guy who was the media spokesman for this front group that was set up to discredit uh, SICO. Uh, the health, the front group was Healthcare America. So they used those terms, those words especially, to make people think that this was a true grassroots organization. 
but it was nothing of the kind. It was a, a front group that was, uh, was, was set up with industry, special interest money, and the money was paid to a big PR firm in Washington, APCO Worldwide, to create this front group. And if you call the, uh, the media contact for Healthcare America, you would have reached a guy named Bill Pierce at his desk at APCO Worldwide, <laughs> because there was no Healthcare America. <laughs> Uh, in reality, although they did go to the trouble of getting um, uh, a virtual address at a uh, at one of these virtual offices in Washington on, uh, uh, at the uh, at the Willard office building, and I went by the way to check that out when I was in Washington recently, just to to make sure that it was indeed virtual. And it's a fine place. It's a, if you if you have a front group, that's a great place to go get your front group uh, an address. But. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, if you if you need to have a meeting, you can you can go there. They can rent uh, a, a conference room for you, and they can sell you the, the address. And you you can even have someone answer the phone there for you. So, it was a good deal for them. Um, but anyway, um, uh, this guy who is the media contact took exception to my saying in the book that the funding came from the insurance industry, and he he pointed out that no no no. It was the pharmaceutical industry that really provided the seed money to start this front group. He's really pr quite proud of that. So, and he was pointing out that, that obviously was meaning that the rest of my book was was not right as well. But, uh, but the fact is that the 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 insurance industry uh, really put Healthcare America uh, to good use and and to discredit Michael Moore's movie Sicko. And uh, as I wrote in the book, uh, the, the the PR campaign uh, was such that. The industry was very fearful of, of Michael Moore and said that if uh, their first efforts were not successful in blunting the impact of the movie, that they would have to uh, push Michael Moore off a cliff, um, which was figurative, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, it ne but it never was necessary. He's still walking around. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but it just gives you an idea of the links that companies will go to, that the insurers will go to, and the pharmaceutical companies will go to, to win. They will do whatever it takes, as the lady at the, at the uh, uh, Beverage Association said. These are high stakes, uh, and uh, they, they want to make sure that they win. And they did win a great deal, uh, to skip ahead a little bit, uh, to the health care reform debate in shaping the legislation that the president signed. They were very uh, uh, successful in getting what they wanted. They had two major objectives. One was to make sure that um, the bill included an individual mandate, that all of us buy, have to buy insurance from them unless we're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid or uh, TRICARE or uh, some other government program. Uh, and that was job one. Job two was to make sure there was no public option in the legislation. Of course, the first one was to make sure there was no real debate on single payer. And that was pretty easy because they had uh, uh, persuaded even the Democratic leadership that that was a non-starter. So you s the, the Democrats started with, with a compromise, in my view. And it was downhill from, from there on. And the insurance industry certainly was uh, helping to write major sections of the legislation. And there's no doubt in my mind that they were very instrumental in writing and, and making certain that the individual mandate was in there. When Barack Obama was campaigning for president, he campaigned against that. Uh, Hillary Clinton and John Edwards said they felt an individual mandate was necessary. Barack Obama said no, he disagreed. That was one of the things that differentiated his campaign platform from the others. Uh, he said he didn't think that Americans should be forced to buy something they can't afford. And he said he thought that we should have a public option as well to keep the industry honest. And of course you all know that at one point he said that if we could start from scratch, he thought we should have a single pair system. But he, he was persuaded, as were the other Democratic leaders, that, uh, that we couldn't start with scratch. We had to start with the system that we have here and try to reform what we've got. And uh, I think what we wound up with is it's a stretch to call it health care reform. Uh, it's in many ways kind of a Band-Aid on some of the, the most egregious problems that we have. Thank you. But they got what the insurance industry got much of what they wanted, and uh, they also have elected a Congress they like now, at least the House. Uh, there are many things about this legislation they don't like. There are some good consumer protections in the bill. Uh, as you know, it uh, will make illegal the practice of uh, 
um, using pre-existing conditions to uh, uh, keep, you know, from, to, to sell someone insurance. They can't use that anymore. That's one of the reasons why we have so many people who don't have insurance is because you can't buy it at any price in this country if you've been sick. Uh, it will make it illegal for them to uh, cancel your policy when you get sick if you do get a, a, a disease or some, some illness or, or, or have an accident in which you have a lot of uh, medical expenses. Uh, that's, that's called a rescission and, and it was a common practice. It's been one of the tools that the industry has used for quite a long time to be sure that they're not paying more for medical care than Wall Street wants them to pay. Uh, and it will require them to spend at least 80% of what we send them in premiums on medical care. So there are a lot of things they don't like about this legislation. There are some good consumer protections, some things uh, have been made illegal that should have been made illegal a long time ago. But what they want now is to, despite the rhetoric, uh, they want to preserve the individual mandate. Uh, that is most important to them but they would like their newly elected members of Congress to begin to strip out some of the consumer protections that are in this legislation. Uh, so the, the whole notion that, that Congress is going to repeal this bill is nothing more than, um, um, well, it's a smokescreen. It's not going to happen, folks. Uh, the insurance companies don't want it to happen. And you can rest assured that the lobbyists for the uh, insurance companies have already had meetings with the new members of Congress and said, here's the way things are. You might believe, actually, your, the talking points that we and others have given you, that this is a government takeover of the healthcare system, but just forget that. Uh, this is actually a legis legislation that will keep us in business. The insurance companies cannot go on without this legislation. They wanted, they needed this because you cannot continue to shift more and more of the cost of health care to individuals and expect people to continue to buy their products, more and more people will find that they, they just have to forego buying coverage. Uh, and you can't keep shifting the cost of care to folks uh, and, and, uh, and, and forever because eventually people will realize that there's not value there uh, and will stop buying their products. So they need this to force people to, to buy their products. And they've explained that by now to the uh, new members of Congress. They will go through the motions of, of passing a bill in the House, no doubt about it. The Senate will not. The Senate won't even bring the bill up for a vote because there's no member of the, any committee that will allow that to happen. Um, so uh, the House will get, the Republicans will get what they want out of this. They'll be able to tell the folks who voted for them, who truly think this was the government takeover, that uh, they tried, and it was the bad Senate that kept them from, from doing this, from doing what they should do. When all along, what their real objective is, and what they're working on right now, is to attack the consumer protections and the, uh, uh, the new regulations in the bill, and try to strip them out one by one. And they will be using language, like I write about in this bill, to try to make us think that that's good for us. They will try to say that what we need now is a, is a common sense market-based approach to health care reform. Remember those words because you'll be hearing them more and more. Doesn't that sound right? Doesn't that sound good to you? Yeah. Well, it will to most Americans. They will say, boy, that sounds like maybe that's exactly what we should finally do. Have a common sense health care reform plan that's market-based. And we'll, they'll say that the insurance companies uh, they'll say that this bill uh, is a one-size-fits-all for Americans. And what really we need is to give the health insurance companies more flexibility. They need to have more flexibility in being able to design benefit plans. Benefit design flexibility is what they'll be asking for. So that they'll be able to uh, get Congress to um, uh, repeal the section or undo the section that prohibits them from selling uh, products to senior citizens before they reach Medicare age uh, and charge them uh, more than three times as much as young people. They'll say, that's too restrictive. And by doing that, we're punishing young people. So they'll be trying to divide the young folks against the old folks by saying that they're too re these are too restrictive. So these are just examples of some of the things they'll be doing. You can best bet your bottom dollar that the rhetoric you will hear will be uh, directed at repealing the good things that are in the bill uh, using fancy language that'll make you think it makes common sense. 
So with that, I'll, I'll uh, just uh, end and uh, maybe we can take some questions for the rest of our time together. Thank you very much. To the questions, uh, I wanted to uh, alert you to the fact that uh, our local chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program is truly struggling in terms of our financial support. Uh, and I've asked members of our board uh, to actually pass out some pledge cards to people here. Passing them out, and then at the end of the night, we will collect them from you. There are several of us you will see around the room. Um, Ayanna uh, Jordan, a uh, medical student, uh, MD, PhD student at Einstein, Yay. on our board, uh, will be handling the mic. And uh, let's get some questions from you for uh, Mr. Potter. Cameron, you can just stand up there. Well, well, give him the mic. He needs to be able to say it loud and clear so everybody hears. I understand, but we want you to have the mic. Uh, hi, Cameron uh, Gibson from SUNY Downstate Medical Student. Um, so, as you said, the new Congress that just got elected is much more friendly to the health insurance industry. However, in Vermont, we have now a governor who is not so friendly to the health insurance industry, someone who ran on a single-payer platform. That's very exciting. For, uh, yeah. So I was just wondering, have you noticed any uh, activity that happening in Vermont or nationally maybe to try and preemptively attack the new governor in Vermont because he will be trying to get a, uh, an exemption from Obama. Yeah, no, and, and you won't see it, no one will notice it, but you can rest assured it's going on behind the scenes to try to, to uh, develop a campaign to uh, discredit the idea of a single-payer system anywhere. Uh, and they'll, they'll do it in California, they'll do it in Vermont, uh, and anywhere else where it's raised. They're, it's not a big market, Vermont isn't, for any of the big insurers, but they don't want any, any state to fall. Uh, so they will, uh, uh, they'll, they'll throw a lot of resources behind the scenes. You probably won't see their fingerprints on this effort uh, because they don't want you to see their fingerprints on it. They will be funneling money into other organizations to mount a campaign against it. Uh, you can expect an organization to do just kind of like what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce did and the National Federation of Independent Business. And I, wouldn't, I would suspect that uh, one or both of those, maybe the National Federation of Independent Business might take the lead to be the front group organization. It's a legitimate organization, but it's often a front for the insurers. But you'll see organizations like that uh, really leading the effort against it, but it will get a lot of funding, you rest assured, from all of us in this room through the premiums we pay. Uh, because a, a significant amount of the premiums we pay uh, are skimmed off for lobbying and advertising and propaganda campaigns and a lot of other things, including uh, making CEOs rich. But, but that will be going on. They, they, um, uh, they don't want any state to enact a single-payer system. When California passed it, thank you, a couple of times, uh, they weren't too alarmed. They didn't show their, their cards because uh, they knew Arnold Schwarzenegger could be counted on to veto it. And now with Jerry Brown in the governor's office, uh, they're going to have to pay a lot more attention to California too. But they will. Uh, we won't see uh, too much of them visibly, but uh, I'll be watching for signs of their involvement. Right here. The Tea Party people are very fond of saying they want to starve this and starve that, and I've heard them use that for the health care bill. Is there a danger the way to look at it, it actually I don't think so. This, a lot of this doesn't require it. No, it doesn't really call, cost anything for, um, uh, to, to tell insurance companies they, they have to be more consumer friendly. Uh, it doesn't create a significant layer of bureaucracy in Washington. Uh, so there, there's a, a misunderstanding about what the bill does. Now there is a significant amount of money, of course, to expand the Medicaid program, uh, uh, but that's needed, and that's, that's a, those are, those, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, there are uh, quite there's quite a lot of money that would go into funding community programs and things like that that could be starved. 
but some of the more fundamental things that reform the system, uh, they really can't be starved. Uh, they will, they are already going, a lot of the things already are going into effect and they don't require any specific funding. So yeah, they could probably cut off funding for some of the community grants. And there is grant money, for example, to uh, help uh, nurse practitioners get practices up and running and to uh, assist uh, in getting more primary care doctors uh, uh, and to pay for their education and get them into areas that are underserved. So it does a lot of good stuff like that that you could see funding cut off from. If you're comfortable, please tell us your names. Uh, just it's nice to get a sense of who are the people that are here. You know, what you say is, uh, is clear about what the problems are and how things are run by the insurance industry, but for some of us, at least, that's not new. The issue here is, I haven't heard from you, is what can we effectively do to change this? How can we go about exposing these things? What, what you're doing, of course, is one of that, but exposing them and counteracting them in an effective way so that uh, uh, the, the propaganda can be opened and uh, appropriate information uh, can get out and we can have some effect on the system. Um, do you have any ideas about, and, and I know this is difficult, and I know this is part of doing that, but do you have any ideas about what's not being done that could be done effectively in this way? Well, yeah, I do. And, uh, and, and the reason I put the playbook in there largely was to, uh, to show how, um, how insurers and other special interests get done what they, they get done. They form coalitions. They have organizations that do their bidding for them. One of the problems with the single pair or, uh, organizations is that you often are just dismissed. You're not given very much credit by the media, just as the insurance companies would be dismissed if, if they were communicating all that they wanted to have communicated. Um, you need to have uh, others who are telling your story for you. You also need to spend time developing your messaging in, in ways that will connect with people emotionally. Uh, that's exactly what the, the, the opposition has done. Uh, they took great care to form uh, expressions like a government take over the health care system or, or death panels or job killing health care reform. They're all terms that uh, evoke uh, or elicit um, emotional responses from us. And they're part of a fear mongering campaign, but they can be countered with, with a similar approach. You need to develop language that connects with people emotionally. You can spend all day long trying to communicate the facts of single payer to people, but their eyes will begin to glaze over and they won't believe you, but you need to start telling things in, 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 in stories and, and throwing in data uh, occasionally that backs up what you're trying to do. When, they were, when the industry was seeking to discredit uh, uh, Michael Moore's movie Sicko, they did it by, by bringing people from Canada who had some stories to tell about how they were ill-treated in the Canadian system, and they'd make up stuff about, uh, about the Canadian system. Uh, I'm not suggesting you make stuff up, but you need to start using uh, your facts and figures in, 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 in different ways uh, and to start using telling stories. Now, I can do some things, and I plan to do some things, because I'm going to be doing some journalistic, journalistic work through the Center for Public Integrity, and I want to do writing some stories that aren't covered by the mainstream media uh, and using some of the good data and information that you guys have, have, have developed over the years. But those are just some things. But you need to uh, also even consider uh, uh, the connotation of the term single payer. Uh, the, your opposition has been able to uh, villainize it so much or demonize it so much that the term either isn't understood by most folks uh, and if they have any understanding of it all is probably negative for a lot of people. And you're going to need to spend a lot more time on messaging. And that is at the core of, of what I talk about, is the need to take a look at how you communicate. Uh, you've got all the intellectual arguments in the world to support a single-payer approach, in my view. Or at least a, a, an approach that's a lot better than what we got now. But the special interest are, have been able to uh, you know, kick your butt every time there's been an effort to reform the healthcare system by, by very skillful use of language and uh, forming, forming alliances and setting up front groups as I, I've discussed. You just need to take elements from that. Now you will also, and I'll stress this, 
need to start developing a strategy, and the strategy will have different components, but that's one of the things that distinguishes the corporate world from the advocacy world. They know how to develop strategies. You, I would never have gotten any funding for any project in, in my office without having some kind of a business plan to justify it. And, uh, and it's based on a strategy that, that has to show some uh, reasonable expectations of being successful. Uh, and when you start thinking strategically, then you can begin developing, well, how do we need, what, do we, what groups can we reach out to uh, to be our allies? And, and who do we work with to make sure that our messaging is right? So you just have to take a, a, a strategic approach to this and know it's going to be somewhat long term uh, and, uh, and just begin working at it that way. But just throwing information out there uh, through the media uh, is not going to get it because it's going to be ignored. Uh, you can make pretty effective use of the social of social media and the internet. You don't necessarily have to use the mainstream media anymore as your filter, uh, but you still need to try to uh, develop relationships with individual in influential reporters. The main thing you've got to do is you've got to condition the public uh, to be more understanding of what you're what you're supporting. No politician is going to get behind what you're supporting unless they think the public is going to be behind them. And that's why the insurance industry does what it does so successfully, to influence public opinion. And that's, I know those are, those are broad things, uh, but, but, but you just, you know, I don't think anyone anywhere has the strategy in place and the tactics in place, but that's the approach you need to make, you need to take to, to get what you want to achieve. So I see um, a lot of hands. I'm just going to tell you guys the order. So this young lady here, and then you, and then I saw you in the yeah khaki, and then the young man um, in the front. So that's that's the order for now. I'm uh, Esther Confino, Long Island Coalition for National Health Plan. How can we go about discrediting organizations that are getting money from our enemies? I suspect that some, uh, for example, you mentioned healthcare America. <coughs> well, in this area, of course, we have healthcare now, which is a legitimate advocacy organization. But during the campaign for the bill, uh, suddenly there appeared on the horizon healthcare for America now. That was obviously deliberate, a deliberate attempt to confuse the public. And I suspect that they were paid for by some industry people. How do we find out if this is so and discredit these organizations? And also, how do we get the ear of investigational uh, news people who will regard this as a great coup if they can do an investigation and publicize this illegitimate work? Go to the website, uh, the organization I work with, uh, or have been working with, the Center for Media and Democracy, uh, has, it does continuing work on trying to unmask the front groups and, and to provide information about um, who's paying for these organizations and who the individuals are involved in them. And you'll go to a, a site called sourcewatch.org, which is operated, or it's actually a part of the Center for Media and Democracy. And you'll f you can find a lot of information if you if you come across an organization you s you're suspicious about, and you should be suspicious about all of them. Um, uh, see what you can find at sourcewatch.org, and um, uh, write letters to the editor. Uh, become uh, active. Uh, this is one thing I, I, I want to stress that we all need to be mindful of that uh, we as individuals can do quite a bit of work as well as we can collectively. Um, Write letters to the editor to express your point of view. Um, write letters to your members of Congress. Call your members of Congress. Uh, call your legislator, your insurance commissioner. Just stay active. Get active and stay active. And uh, uh, you can't really necessarily rely on the mainstream media to, to do what you want them to do. There are far fewer reporters than there used to be, far, far fewer uh, investigative reporters. And that's another reason why I, I want to do this this assignment with the Center for Public Integrity is to uh, do some investigative reporting, to shine some light into uh, these sham organizations and to report, a, report on them. So if you come across them, let me know. 
if you are suspicious of a some organization that you're hearing about, um, just let me know. And, uh, and either I or someone at the, at the Center for Media and Democracy can look into it. And, and they do quite a bit of work on their own. They get the word out. Now, admittedly, it doesn't reach as, it doesn't go as far and wide as, as, as I wish it would. But I'm going to be doing some um, work that hopefully will be, uh, I'll be a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, the work that I do. So I, I, I I'm going to be starting this thing called Healthcare Watch, and it will be hopefully watching over uh, our healthcare system and, and what happens to this legislation, how it's being implemented, uh, and how the insurance companies will, will try to thwart the implementation of it, but also how it affects real people, what the uh, benefits of it are, and what the shortcomings of it are, what the unintended consequences are. Uh, hi, Jerry Kahn, uh, single payer action. Um, John, I get down. Healthcare for America now is a uh, was a Democratic Party front group. Uh, there was a, an event down at Judson Memorial Church uh, about a year ago before the, well, anyway, before the bill passed, and Senator, or, uh, uh, Mr. Dean, Mr. Dean, I'm trying to say, Dr. Dean, was uh, his group, Democracy for New York, where it was called. They were all Democratic Party organizations. This makes it clear to me that there are two parties who are working against the goals of the people in this room. Not number two. Now, without making a big speech about, you know, ideology, I think it's just, it's, it's very obvious. Health care for America now, and then find out about all these other groups. Democratic Party, the president, etc. Et and yes, health, uh, uh, insurance company money behind all of them, of course. Anyway, my point is, I just want to bring that up and then sort of challenge all of you to realize that there is a political power question here. You can be as good at messaging as you want. If you aren't running candidates or challenging Democrats who are running for office to start getting out there and defending single payer, instead of just like, you know, uh, co-sponsoring 676, but actually going out and selling for it, then you're not really taking the very action that needs to take place. No, I, I agree with you. We all need, to, or you all need to be. I'm, I'm not speaking necessarily as an advocate because I'm truly going to try to be more of a journalist and, and be a reporter and an analyst of what goes goes on uh, going forward. Um, but but your advice is good to stay active and, and get involved. Now, full disclosure. Um, I know the folks at Healthcare for America now, and I know folks in almost all the single payer organizations and, and have good relationships with all of them. Um, when I was trying to decide what to do, um, I was initially afraid to, to be public. I thought I could uh, work behind the scenes to uh, uh, provide some information, knowledge and information to advocates of reform. So I, that was my approach. I was really afraid of retaliation. I didn't know what the industry would do if I did go public, and so I thought, I'm not even going to attempt it. Uh, obviously, I changed my mind later, um, uh, because I was persuaded that going public would be the most effective way to, to do this. But I was persuaded by folks at Healthcare for America Now. Um, there are some good folks there who really had um, the best interests of the country at heart. I also reached out and, and talked to a lot of uh, single-payer organizations. In fact, some of the first people I talked to were people who were my friends in the single-payer movement. But they just didn't know exactly what to do with me. Uh, they were encouraging, but uh, I, it was quite a long time before I made some connections to figure out, well, how, what is the best thing I can do? And it was through a contact, someone I know at Healthcare for America Now, that I was introduced to Senator Rockefeller's staff. And I, uh, you know, that was what got me going, was that testimony. So, I, and I, I understand history. I know what you're talking about. And I know there's a lot of uh, um, maybe ill will uh, toward health care for America now because it did not, uh, it's sort of pushed single payer to, to the side, I guess. Um, and, and that's regrettable. But, uh, uh, it, I, I do know a lot of the folks who, who are part of that organization, and I do know that the, um, uh, 
that the that the work that it did was was not work that the insurance industry uh, supported. Um, but I guess that the larger message is to get one of the one of the ways that the insurance industry and other special interests have been able to achieve what they've wanted to achieve is that they have they've worked cohesively and they have worked they've recruited allies and they've had a pretty strong and unified front um, you might not necessarily find people who will be 100 percent in agreement with you that a canadian style system is the way that we have to go i don't know maybe you maybe you can maybe we ultimately can but i guess my advice is to uh, begin with the end in mind as stephen covey would have said what is it we we actually want to accomplish uh, and how do we go about doing that? What is what really is politically feasible? We live in a, a political world. I was the second time I was interviewed by Bill Moyers. He also had um, um, Dr. Um, Angel, um, Marsha Angel, on the program, and we weren't together. We were interviewed at different times, but he ran, I guess, my segment and then her segment. I can't remember which order, but uh, uh, and she was not a fan of of what was about to be passed in, in the Congress. I said, when I was talking to Moyers, that I didn't like it all that much either, but I felt that there was enough good in the legislation that we probably should pass it, that I really didn't agree with the idea of killing the bill. Because you know, I was writing the book at the time, and I know, I know the history, and I was a part of these efforts, and I know how successful they are to keep reform from happening. And I was so worried that if we miss this opportunity, then when, when would we ever have the next opportunity to do anything meaningful? And I know, you know, the, the researchers, um, uh, uh, Himmelstein and, and Woolhandler and others, tell us that 45,000 people die every year because we don't have insurance. I didn't want to have another person die in this country because they don't have insurance. This won't keep all those people from dying, but I think it might help a little bit. Uh, and that was why I said that I thought that even without the public option, we needed to get something passed. And I saw that as the end of the beginning of reform. And I think that's what we need, how we need to look at this. And we need to try to keep the good things from being repealed so that the insurance companies really win the day here. Um, but um, it was wrong that single payer wasn't given more of a hearing than it was. I hope that the next round, and eventually it can. Um, but the ultimate point I'm making is we need to work together cohesively and pool resources, uh, develop stra a strategy that everyone can, can buy into, and, um, uh, and that is how you can achieve victory. You can't, I don't think, do it unless you can work uh, in larger numbers and work, uh, recruit allies and try to, to work cooperatively. There's a lot I know that we all share in common, um, but we can be our own worst enemies if, we, uh, uh, if we're not careful. Hi, Mr. Potter, and hello, everybody. Um, my name's James Kennedy, and uh, I apologize to any Democrats in the room because we're going to have two Greens in a row, I think. Uh, I'm uh, running for state assembly in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and uh, I'm a very strong single-payer uh, proponent. Um, and I am also an uninsured person. Um, I'm going to have a bit of a Lyndon Johnson moment a little later with my shirt. I have an untreated hernia. Um, one of the experiences that I had, I went for a few years. I had trouble paying for school, and I went for a few years without insurance and when I did get back on insurance and was in school I uh, almost immediately after that uh, my spleen exploded I almost died it's very serious and they ended up spending about a quarter of a million dollars uh, and I was very lucky because we had one of these uh, union type insurances my my mother's not very high income but she does work as a, a school secretary and so she has decent insurance and uh, we didn't pay more than a few hundred dollars I don't think and it was a quarter of a million dollar bill um, and so I had that experience and then immediately afterwards, because I've reached the age where I was off insurance, I became uninsured again. I've been uninsured since. And uh, walking through my neighborhood, uh, just picking up my groceries, uh, I was bit by a dog and the dog was not, the dog bite was not serious. Uh, it was a very small nick. 
but of course you need to get rabies shots and so on. Uh, and a rabies shot runs about three thousand um, dollars. So I went to the local hospital, uh, which is the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in my neighborhood. Uh, it's top ten, they like to boast. And I sat in the emergency room for quite some time. And when I did get to the doctor, the doctors were very happy to. Just a few questions because there's a lot of people that want to answer. I will move on to my question. Um, my doctors were very happy to treat me. The weasel who was in charge of uh, the hospital billing was not, and he suggested that I should find the dog and get it tested, uh, and that maybe I didn't need a rabies shot, and so on. Um, my concern here, uh, I think that it's very important at this point for us to challenge the Democrats from the left. I think that the point that you made during your speech about the, the Democratic proposal, we do need to, I agree, save the good parts of the bill. Um, but the Democratic proposal is essentially what the insurance industries want at this point. Um, and so I wonder, again, I mean, you've already had this question, but I guess I feel like I want to pose it again. What do you think should be done to challenge the Democrats from the left so that they don't just become the moderate mouthpieces of the insurance industry? Thanks. I think you should. I think it's important to challenge the Democrats from the left. I think uh, you always have to have that challenge and, and, and making sure that it's understood that there is an, an expectations from the Democratic base. And, and, and a lot of the Democratic base obviously comprise, comprises people uh, on the left side of the political spectrum. Uh, you need to, to do it in ways, though, that make them understand that, that you know, you have some proposed solutions or some ideas that make sense, uh, and uh, and that you can help. They need they need political cover. This is what is is the thing. Um, they will if they don't feel that they've got uh, wide support uh, from the left, uh, then they won't they won't think that there are any left people who will be there to vote for them. You have to make them understand that they have a significant constituency on the left. Uh, these are political folks. They want to run for re-election. They want to run for election. They want to run for re-election. Uh, so they need to understand that there, is, there are people who are willing to vote for them. And you have, they, you have to uh, make sure that they have su some support in their districts to, to, to win. What happens is some of the, the best intentioned members of Congress uh, uh, get to Congress sometimes by fluke. Maybe the, the special interests haven't paid quite enough attention to them and they, they, they sneak in. Uh, what happens is that uh, the, when, the, when they start voting against industry needs, the industry will then mount a campaign against them the next time they run for re-election. So you've got to keep that in mind. They are not only fighting for votes, they're fighting to defend, uh, fend off their opponents. And they, the special interests fund the campaigns of the, uh, uh, of the, the people they like. They will, they will recruit candidates to run against uh, members of Congress who've not been voting their way. Just become a, st a student of how, how, it, how it's worked, how it works in Congress, uh, how influential the special interests are. But I'll just reiterate, you've got to make sure that not only are you offering them uh, your, your own support, but you're making, you, you work to in, in your community to make sure that there are others of like mind who are also putting pressure on these members of Congress so that they fully understand that there is, there is the expectation that you have. Another thing to do is to call members of Congress when they're in session. I spent a lot of time on, on Capitol Hill during the debate, and I would go from office to office, and when there was a significant vote in the Senate, uh, for example, uh, the, the special interest would be ginning up the robocalls, and the, the phone would be ringing off the hook. And so the impression that that gives is that the people in the district or the state are very much opposed to this legislation. So you've got to understand how, how it works, and you've got to make sure that the people you're supporting, um, uh, if they're a Democrat, understand that there are many other like-minded people of you, and you've got to be visible, and you've got to be active. Okay, right here, and Joanne, and I don't know how many more questions we can take. Yeah, I'd say yeah. five. 
Hi, Wendell. Uh, I was very involved with uh, MoveOn.org in the 2009 campaign for the public option. Um, and I wish we had pushed for the uh, single payer, but that's history. Um, I got you to sign my book, and I'm going to take this opportunity to plant a seat in everybody's head that, and ask you the question is, why don't we make health care a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, that it's an, an inal inalienable right to equal to the life, um, pursuing life, liberty, and pr pursuit of happiness, why not affordable and appropriate health care? Has anybody ever talked about it as an amendment to the Constitution that everybody's covered? And what's wrong? How do you argue with somebody um, that says, that what's wrong with a healthy citizen rate? And if, we, if we're a war nation, and if we have 50 million people that are un not insured and 25 million that are underinsured, and God forbid our shores are, are, um, are ever uh, attacked, we're we're a nation of obese people, not healthy, and how, only so, only so many of us have guns. So has it ever come up as far as um, a constitutional amendment for health care? I like the idea. I don't know if it's yeah. I, I don't know how you get it going, but I, I like the idea because it would give you the opportunity to bring issues up, and they would have to be covered by the media. I think, and and it, obviously when you're doing an amendment, it has to get state approval so you could do this state by state. I like the idea. I think it could be something, even if it doesn't succeed, you just, it would, it would, it would make sure that there is a continuing debate and you would continue to be able to bring up the issues that we need to be solved in this country. I'll start a website. Okay, go for it then. Um, Steve Auerbach, I'm with the uh, PNHP Metro. Can you stand up, Steve, so people can see you? Uh, Steve Arlock with PNHP Metro. Um, I have, as you can tell from the uniform, I have TRICARE, so of course I have great coverage. I just wish all of America had as good coverage as I do. Um, I, it's sort of a two-part question, and if the first one is too, too leading, feel free to jump to the second. Um, Obama ran on um, uh, no mandate and yes, public option, and of course what we got was no public option and yes, mandate. Um, given that, putting aside for a moment, guarantee issue of community rating, but from at least that point of view, AHIP got exactly what they want. They got their script. How much of it was Kabuki theater? And how much of it was real debate? I mean, was this basically a preordained, you know, that we're not gonna quite get the 60 in the Senate, you know, we'll get close, we'll make it look good, and how much was this theater with more or less preordained that's number one. Related to that, number two, on the individual mandate, um, with regard to what's going on in the courts, with uh, the individual mandate, the very odd Virginia ruling, where it was very narrowly written just against the individual mandate, the one thing that they get wants, and yet this is, quote unquote, a conservative judge and a conservative movement for the Tea Party folks against the individual mandate. We PNHP people, of course, are against the mandate, because we understand it's, it's what the insurance companies want to keep them in business. So how much of that right-wing movement against the individual mandate is real? How much of it is um, at, the movement out of control? In other words, all of a sudden, the, the, the PR people and, and the, uh, the astroturfs losing control of the message. Or is there some meta kabuki that we're not getting that you can tell us about? <laughs> yeah. Well, the... The first question, uh, I think the President was sin sincere in going into the White House thinking that uh, health care reform could go forward with a public option and not have a mandate. Uh, the insurance industry, as I said earlier, job one was to persuade him otherwise. And they, um, as they, they picked an emissary of the industry to go to the White House on many occasions, uh, Ron Williams of Aetna. Uh, in fact, I, I know Ron, and he was the champion of the individual mandate within the health insurance industry. Uh, some of the CEOs, including my CEO, Ed Hanway, were reluctant to embrace that because they don't like mandates of any kind. And uh, they were fearful of it, that if, if there was a, 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 a mandate like this, then, then what's to keep states from going further with benefits mandates? So they just are ideologically opposed to mandates, period. But Ron Williams prevailed, and, and AHIP embraced the idea. It was part of their uh, collective um, platform, if you will, what they needed to do. And I know this because I was there when it happened. So 
it was important for Ron Williams to persuade the president, and he made at least a half a dozen uh, visits to the White House, and that was at his own admission to a Forbes magazine reporter. Um, so they got that job done. They were, he was, he's a very persuasive guy, uh, and, and I talked to folks in the White House who uh, I was challenging them. They said, well, Ron Williams is one of the more reasonable people within the health insurance industry. Well, of course, they sent someone who appeared to be reasonable and who could be <laughs> persuasive. So that's, that's what happened. Uh, they, they didn't count on what happened in Massachusetts. They really thought that there could be 60 votes, that the Senate could pass a bill, and that there would be a conference committee, and they could iron out the differences between the House and the Senate. What I think advocates of the public option didn't count on was the, the ability of the health insurance industry to get to Joe Lieberman and say, Joe, here's the way it is. And, uh, and he, he was there for them. And he kept it from happening, along with you know what happened in, in Massachusetts. So they, they really, d it, it got to the point that uh, Senator Claire McCaskill was quoted, um, in, well, she, I saw her being interviewed, and she was asked, well, what happened, Senator? Why are you voting on a bill now that doesn't have the public option? How did so much of it get away from you? And she said, we lost the messaging battle, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, AHIP was very able to uh, get its messaging done at every level, and including in the White House, and including uh, uh, in you know out in the public. Your your second question with regards to what's happening with the the challenge to the individual mandate. Uh, I'm sure that the the insurance executives are pretty apoplectic about this because they need it. Um, the thing is that they got they they were almost too clever by half. They they really were. Uh, persuading the folks on the, the right that this was a government takeover. That was part of strategy. They thought that would help elect more Republicans, and that worked. But they don't support this challenge to the constitutionality of it. Uh, they need it. Uh, and you see, what happens is people start believing their own talking points. And, and you also, if you are on the left or the right, you believe things because you are on the left or the right. And you believe what somebody tells you you should think if you're on the left or the right, and some of that's going on. Uh, and they just have, they don't have much of a real understanding of, of what's at stake and how the insurance industry works. So there's a lot of ignorance. I found that as I was going around Capitol Hill, that there was an astonishing lack of understanding about how the health insurance system works in this country. Astonishing ignorance. Uh, now I'm not so astonished uh, <laughs> because you see how people get elected, uh, but uh, uh, they have a fair amount of understanding of how Medicare and Medicaid works because they're government programs, but they don't know private insurance, and you can't expect the attorneys general to know that. So they thought they were doing a good thing here, uh, but I'm I'm sure that the health insurance industries industry will do all it can to make sure that that constitutional challenge. Uh, gets squashed somewhere along the way, um, and I wouldn't be if it goes to the Supreme Court. It'll be interesting to see uh, how the insurance industry weighs in on this. Very interesting, and I'm just kind of agnostic on on what should happen to it. To tell you the truth, uh, my name is Joanne Landy, and I'm um, a member of the and I'm also with the Campaign for Peace and Democracy. Um, I was one of those people who was not for supporting the bill. But I'm not for drawing a line in the sand between people who then were for or against it. I think it is a question of building alliances and working together, partly to defend the good things, yeah. scraps of the NAB, they're, they're important, that are in the bill. But also, I think we need to call attention to the fundamental problem with having a system that's built around these insurance companies. Yes. And I think that we have to ask those people who, in my opinion, mistakenly, but you know, it's a, you can argue for years about whether it's a mistake or not. What do we do now about a system that <coughs> is built on a, on a house of cards, yes. you know, on an insurance company? I think we have to find ways to build alliances. I don't like the word front group because it sounds like a lie, you know, a dishonest thing. But real alliances with people who may disagree about what should have been done then, yeah. but want to go forward with really making a frontal attack and explaining to people, to our public, why this insurance company thing is so key. 
I agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. Uh, there is, uh, in this country, as the insurance industry's pollsters know, um, the health insurance industry is held in very low esteem, just slightly above the tobacco industry, just slightly. Honestly, I've seen the, I've seen the data. And, uh, and that's why they know they have to work through third parties and front groups to get their messaging out. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. You, you've got some advantages here. You've got truth for one thing. Uh, but you could certainly, I think, mount a fear-mongering campaign that would be based entirely in fact. Uh, there, there is, and I think you should consider it. Uh, people have been led to fear more government than the intrusion in their lives of, of the health insurance industry. They don't really truly understand it, and that's what I try to do, is to explain what's going on. But to counter the notion that this was the government takeover of the healthcare system, at times I've said, well, that's not true, but really what we do have, what's, what has been going on while we weren't paying a lot of attention, is we've had a Wall Street takeover of our healthcare system. And so that's, you know, that's just an example of, of trying to find a term that will connect with people and they say, oh, what do, you, what do you mean? And you can have a conversation like around that. And, and uh, uh, there, there are no government sanctioned death panels, but there are corporate medical directors who make life and death decisions. So yes, death panels do exist inside big corporate insurance companies. Uh, I am a psychiatrist here in New York, and uh, I don't know if there are any cardiologists or dermatologists or obstetricians here, or oncologists, and I hope that if they are, they won't be offended. But I generally believe that the big enemy is the single payer plan and medical specialists, because they're the most conservative element in this country. Do you have any idea how we can budge this group? Well, possibly. I mean, um, uh, I know a lot of doctors fear more government, they, and it, sometimes it's, it's an irrational fear. I mean, uh, but I know even specialists have to spend an, a significant amount of revenue on administrative functions dealing with insurance companies. Uh, so there ought to be some way to uh, uh, begin to work with specialists. Yeah, they make a ton of money and they want to protect their income. And that's one of the things you always have to keep in mind that one, why it's so hard for reform is that you're talking about somebody's income being affected with reform. Uh, and they're, they're going to be a hard nut to crack. But I think you're just going to have to start beginning to build some bridges and trying to, maybe, maybe there's some research you all can do to, to, that could help persuade uh, uh, specialists that uh, uh, look, you're not getting such a good deal here. Maybe things could be better for you. Think about, you know, look at it from their perspective. What, what do they want out of this? You always kind of need to do that when you're trying to advocate for changes and, and trying to persuade someone to see something from your point of view. Well, what have they got? Uh, uh, what can they get out of it? Why should they be persuaded? Why would a new system or some new way of being uh, or doing or practicing medicine be to their advantage. So you need to have to, you need to shift the focus so that they can see the advantages to them of uh, a different system. Let me just point out, we do have an oncologist here tonight. Uh, we also have a dermatologist here tonight. Um, and uh, they're really sh endocrinologist um, Cardiolo and cardiologist. And cardiologist. And okay. And a urologist. So, we'll take we'll take two more questions at this point. I think we really are at the uh, end of our time. But uh, Dr. Bassett, yeah. Uh, I'm Mary Bassett. I'm a member of the PNHP Metro Board, and I really like um, your soundbite there that it, Wall Street has taken over uh, healthcare. Um, I hadn't ever thought of phrasing it that way. And I want to ask you a question about whether the insurance industry is concerned about how it markets itself to the rest of the industry, maybe the manufacturing industry, which is not Wall Street, um, which has paid also a high price for the cost yeah. of uh, the rising cost of health care. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. I think that is another area where you can build some alliances with, with business. Uh, certainly with, with uh, small business owners, uh, and I, I mentioned this some, I think, earlier, uh, there's an organization called the Small Businessman Majority, 
which is a progressive organization that uh, uh, represents a lot of uh, small businesses. It's kind of the counter to the National Federation of Independent Business, which is a uh, real conservative and often a, a shill uh, front group for the, for the insurers. Um, big businesses, uh, they, they, there's kind of a, a win and lose for them with the current system. Um, yeah, they have to pay a lot for uh, uh, health benefits, but they also benefit from having employees locked into the system. We've got a lot of job lock in this country because of the system we've got. And if you get a job in a corporation, you're, you consider yourself pretty lucky because you've got benefits, your health benefits are pretty good. And you know that if you uh, want to strike out on your own and start your own company, uh, you're afraid of doing that. Many people are because uh, uh, of the fact you can't take your benefits with you or you have to get benefits in the individual market. So I, I would think that, that, that you could really build a good economic case for business leaders, and it's one of the things I want to try to work on, to explain to folks we could have a huge economic boom in this country if we could unlock a lot of these jobs. And uh, uh, I, I'm certain that some of our best and brightest are locked into corporate jobs and they're miserable. I was miserable there, I was afraid to leave. And I and I I'm, uh, but I and I, I'm I'm just confident that there are literally millions of people who would like to um, uh, remove the shackles of big corporations. I, I'm I'm Nick Pearson. The reason I come so dressed, and incidentally rather similarly the way Ali is, is like I just came from a county medical society board of directors meeting, where I had to sell some things. But uh, there aren't too many physicians here. But we're talking about fee-for-service medicine. Now, that's the point that's just been brought up. Let me briefly say that fee-for-service medicine is addressed by the accountable care organization principle. And when we look at accountable care organizations, and we need to spend a lot of energy within the profession, not so much in this room. There are probably 10 people here, dermatologists, cardiologists, I'm a cardiologist, so on who are cared about that, but let me tell you there is an answer within the medical profession that accountable care organizations are proposed in the new organization, yes. are logical, will save a hell of a lot of money despite the uh, counter stuff. And incidentally, I should have started out by saying you've done. Accountable care organizations, part of a PPACA is, which says that we need to develop a new, this is Obamacare, we need to develop a new system that looks into how we take care of, of patients. And let me just say, because we're not talking mostly in this room to physicians, but to those five or eight physicians who did speak up and say, I care about my specialty, that the fee-for-service pro uh, proposal is not dead within the proposal, that it is possible to metabolize and generate with a lot of support from the profession. Now, the reason I'm at the Medical Society meeting before I come here is to persuade them, and instantly they're completely in support of it. County Medical Society, 4,000 members. Uh, even more members than we got, Ali, in, in New York from PNHP, okay. The, the, these people are, are, are with it, and they are potentially with the message that you have brought us. Now, a, a little work needs to be done, and I'm yeah. out there to try to help do it. At the age of 81, am I going to be able to do it? Who knows, but I'm going to try. Uh, at any rate, I, I just want to say that there is a response within organized medicine for fee-for-service that it is tremendously logical that we can have better incomes, not have to hire so many secretaries to send things to insurance companies, and uh, that there is a solution here. Uh, not time to develop that in more detail, but let me just say thank you hugely for your coming from the other side of the fence. Uh, I have a micro question about Karen Inyanyi, whom I've met over the years and worked with and liked a lot. She's a wonderful person. She is. And, and, but she's uh, employed by the, the team at this point. <laughs> so yeah. we've got to get to AHIP also. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're, you're right, Dick, uh, and, and just to, to, to be really succinct, you've got the beginning of, of, of an outreach to other doctors. Uh, you've, you, you've, got, you've got some common interest here that you, you can build from, and I think that you're exactly. Karen Nani, you're right, she's a, she is absolutely wonderful for the health insurance industry. She's a, a, a very, very uh, engaging person. She's, she's brilliant, uh, very personable. Um, 
uh, uh, Uli Reinhardt was, was asked uh, once uh, how much she was made, and he said, how much she makes, he said, she's not paid enough for what she does for the insurance industry. She's one of the most effective lobbyists in Washington. So what I would like to do at this point, number one, is remind people if you haven't filled out a pledge card, please do so. That in uh, February, put on your calendar, February 22nd, we're going to be talking about Vermont uh, and what's happening in Vermont, uh, both from a point of view of uh, how the state is moving in the direction of single payer and what we can do from New York to help that happen. That's at Beth Israel? Pardon? That's at Beth Israel? That most likely will be at Beth Israel, but if you have signed a card tonight, you will know exactly where it will be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I would like to just uh, ask Lori Wen to make one last comment this evening. so much for coming tonight and thank you to PNHP New York Metro for the honor to serve as your new executive director. Thank you Mr. Potter very much for this event. And for this event. I would just like to reiterate what Mr. Potter was urging all of us to do. Yes, we sound like a broken record when we say, call your congressperson, call your senator. Often people say, well, okay, I did, I did. I didn't get what I wanted the last time I did it. Well, keep doing it. And I urge you to do it tomorrow or Wednesday at the latest. Uh, some of you may know that originally, before the horrible tragedy in Arizona, originally the Republicans had scheduled a vote for this Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, to start um, to repeal PPACA uh, or Obamacare, or the new health law. That vote has now been delayed because of what happened in Arizona, but it's gonna happen soon. I urge you as a single payer supporter to call your congressperson and say, to repeal or not to repeal, that is not the question. <laughs> we need to go beyond that because either the current system or the new law is not gonna work because both of those, we're putting out trust in the private health insurance industry. And we know that we cannot do that. So call your congressperson, tell them to go beyond what we really need, beyond talking about repeal, is a single payer Medicare for all system. Thank you. And thank you again to Mr. Potter. Uh, we really have...